And we are live, folks. It is Thursday, September the 14th. This is episode 3,376 of the Survival Podcast. And we are going to go a little bit old school today. We are kind of doing this because of the impending doom, if you want to put it that way, of uh, economic crisis that we're looking at. And the question is not, are we going to have an economic crisis? The question is, what type of economic crisis will we have? How deep will it go? And how long will it last? We're actually going to break down four different types of economic crisis for you. Two, two of, one of which you've been through, if you're older than 10, right? One we've heard about a lot, and some of our grandparents went through it, but we haven't. One that, uh, well... We've seen in other places around the world, but it's never happened here. And one that we've done several times and most people didn't really deeply notice. So there's four types of economic crises, and we'll talk about those. We're going to talk about something called ETPP, which is an acronym I created. It stands for Equipment Training Procedures and Protocols. And it has a lot to do with how you deal with security issues during some of these problems. We're going to talk about helping your neighbors, communicating and get information. We're going to talk about your six primary survival needs, even though they tell you it's five when you're in the woods. But that's basically because when you're in the woods, you can pretty much take a deuce anywhere and it doesn't really matter. You know, unless there's 50 of you and then you're not lost. So we're going to add health and sanitation to those five primary things they teach you about wilderness survival. We're going to talk about some of the most old school stuff in the TSP catalog. Disaster probability versus disaster impact scale and their inverse relationship, which is kind of the core tenant philosophy that I built the show on and a ton more. And we're going to get to all that in just a moment, right after we hear from our two sponsors of the day. Sponsor of the day number one today. We are 30 days out, guys, before I jump in Val, which is my challenger for those that don't know, with my buddy David and cruise my ass all the way up to Camden, Tennessee to hang out with a bunch of really cool people, including a uh, John Willis, Nicole Sauce, Joel Salatin, and more. Of course, I'm talking about the Self-Reliance Festival in Camden, Tennessee. It's very affordable to go. There's some additional events on both sides of it. You can learn how to process chickens from Joel Salatin, the master himself. You can learn about uh, ham radio and emergency radio communications and a bunch of other cool stuff. Or you can just come hang out for a couple of days with me. Or you can get a VIP pass, come hang out with me, and come have dinner with me and the other cool people that will be speaking at SRF. So please come on out. Come check out what we got going on up there. And I'll use this also as a reminder right now. Um, if you ain't coming there and you want to come here, and I mean right here to Nine Mile Farm, quick reminder, Saturday, this Saturday, 0930 Central Standard Time, uh, tickets for TSP 23 go on sale. That's a three-and-a-half-day event. It is going to be awesome this year. I'll tell you more about it later, so we'll we'll drop it there. Just I want to make sure I'm reminding people as much as possible, because every year I hear from people, I didn't even know, and now all the tickets are gone. I've only been talking about it for a month leading up to it. So anyway, I'd love to have you come. Uh, next up today, uh, the Wealth Steading Podcast with John Pugliano. John is an awesome dude, man. John is one of us. He is a prepper. He is an investment manager. He is a ham radio operator. He's the kind of guy that grew up really a lot like I did. I was on the eastern side of Pennsylvania. He was on the west, coal miners in our family. Just a good all-around dude. Met him first in 2011 at a prepper convention in Salt Lake City, Utah. Been working with him one way or another ever since. Been part of our expert council now for like five years. He's helped a tremendous number of people in this audience. He has a great podcast. Again, it's called The Wealth Setting Podcast where you can learn to grow your wealth like you grow a garden. Check it out today, John Pagliano and the Wealth Steading Podcast. With that, let's go ahead and cram on in to what we have to talk about today. Um, this was actually, I, I looked at some older shows and said, like, can I kind of reboot one? And I did this kind of basic, use this ba same basic outline. Um, use this... <laughs> John Pugliano's voice is like butter. I used the same basic outline back in 2017. And the title I gave the show back then was The World Might Not End, But Yours Might. And of course, today's show is Beyond Teotihuacan, Building Your Personal Safety Net. And so we're in that same vein, but we're doing it with the impetus, 
behind it of look how screwed up the global economy is and the U.S. economy are. Look at the situation we're in with interest rates not really being that high, but pricing people out of markets like housing and cars because the artificial interest rates so much pushed up the underlying cost that now a sensible interest rate plus, a, plus a, the current cost make things out of people's reach. And like it just goes on from there. Uh, so that's where we're coming from today. And what I want to start out with is when people come to the world of prepping, they usually come from a place of fear. Now, understand, I am not saying that preppers live in a place of fear. People who actually figure out the proper way to set up resiliency and redundancy in their lifestyle that focus on, you know, two of our tenants, which are self-sufficiency and self-reliance. And self-sufficiency is I don't need anybody for anything for this thing pretty much forever. That's self-sufficiency. And that's generally not something that we become 100% of in any place. So we usually measure self-sufficiency in percentage. If I produce 50% of my food, I'm 50% self-sufficient for food. And we measure self-reliance in time. Self-reliance means I do not need you for a time, right? So if I have six months worth of food, I have six months of self-reliance. I don't need food. I can live for six months on the food that I have. But when I run out, I'm done. But if I have 50% self-sufficiency and six months self-reliance, I can probably finagle that and work it out to where I can go a year without needing anybody. So they work together. And when people start to build redundancy and resiliency into their lives, they have a backup power plan. They have a reserve uh, economic plan where they have money in reserve to cover bills for 90 days. Uh, they're building their life aggressively. Maybe they have an entrepreneurial pursuit. They've seen to their needs of food, water, shelter, energy, health and sanitation and security to the best of their ability. They actually come away. From fear. They become very bold and they kind of just go back to living their lives and fine tune things as they go and say, hey, is the garden doing well? Are we making our, 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 our nut on saving money for the future? If we had to draw out any emergencies, have we put it back? And otherwise, they live their life like a normal person. That is not how most people who have never prepared in their life come to prepping. And I deal with them weekly. It's not as bad as it was back in like when the hype was around 2012 and shit like that, right? It's not like it was three years ago when the COVID started and a whole new flock came in freaking out. But every week there's two or three or four emails that I get that like, you're like, dude, step off the ledge. Don't jump. It's going to be okay. And this comes from a, a standpoint where people find a thing that they fear. And in a way, this is good because it gets people who have done nothing to do something, right? But, you know, somebody shows them usdebtclock.org and they look at the national debt of $32 trillion and it's just growing. You know, like the one dude asked his wife who showed it to him, so when's it go down? And she started laughing at him because it doesn't ever go down. And then somebody explains to them what th – that number is not the big number. And they show them on usdebtclock.org, they show them the unfunded liabilities, explain what unfunded liabilities are, and they realize it's hundreds of trillions of dollars. Money we know we will have to pay that we knew, know we do not have. And then they really freak out. Or something else. You know, uh, They get scared by Chinese videos of people falling over the street wearing paper suits or some stupid shit like that. And then they come to me or they find somebody like me and they start freaking out. And I experienced that right away in the beginning of doing the show, all the way back in 08. And uh, I was like, I have to have a way to explain this to people that can make them rational. And what I came up with is two things. The disaster probability factor, right? And the disaster impact scale and how they had an inverse relationship so we could get people started preparing in a logical, methodical way for the things most likely to happen to them. So what is the probability factor? That is, how likely is it that you will see this disaster in your lifetime? So if we take a Hollywood, you know, end of the world as we know it disaster like a comet impacting earth killing almost every living creature on the planet the actual odds that you are going to see that are incredibly low and if that actually happens what you can do about it is really not much okay and then we would say but what about mundane shit you go to work tomorrow morning 
you think everything's great. You're ready for the weekend and your company knows to fire people on Friday. At about three o'clock, you're watching the clock. You're two hours from leaving. You call into HR with 30 or 40 of your coworkers, and you're all told you're getting laid off. Here's your severance for two weeks and go fuck off elsewhere. Probability of that happening to you in your life at some point is relatively high. And so since that's the case, that would be a good idea for you to start preparing for first. What are the things that most likely will hit you like a two by four in your head. Finding out a spouse has a serious or even terminal illness. Having this, your spouse or someone you love die in a car wreck or be crippled in a car wreck. Ending up, for one reason or another, not able to cover your mortgage for a month or two or three. These are all things that can happen uh, and, and happen to people all the time. A storm comes through and rips the roofs off of several homes in your neighborhood, and it just happens that you were one of the people that had the roof ripped off of your house. Your house catches on fire and burns to the ground. That's a little higher up or lower down on the probability. It was not that many house fires, but it's the, all these things are shit that can happen. You get an ice storm and end up stuck at your house for 14 days. That happened to me. I didn't even care because I do the types of things. These are all high probability but we would also call them relatively low impact events in that they're not low impact for you. Trust me, if you have almost no food in your house and an ice storm locks you in for even four or five days and your heat's off and you don't have any backup heat, it is a high impact event for you. But the reality is most of the rest of the country, probably most of the rest of your state, most of the rest of the world, does not give two shits. They may turn the news on and go, oh, those poor people. Hey, honey, go get me some steaks out of the freezer. We're going to have steak for dinner. And they go on with their life. But you don't make Hollywood movies about that. And it doesn't seem to be the thing that gives people an impetus to start preparing. And then so I also said we do have to acknowledge that there is something called an impact scale and probability, and then there's an inverse relationship, right? So what that means is that these, these other kind of far out there disasters, their impact on the life of the world is much bigger. But there's an inverse relationship. The more people affected by any individual disaster, the less likely that you will experience it in your life. So let's start off from the things that are most likely, accept that inverse relationship, and realize as we start preparing for things like a job loss, uh, an economic downturn, not a complete collapse or something like that, a weather event, et cetera, eventually we'll get about as prepared as our resources will allow us to be for even the extreme. And since I came up with that, we have obviously had one major global event. This is like a gray area between the two. And of course, I'm talking about the pandemic. I will submit to you. That the average person's place in the world was not affected at all by a virus. That if we had done nothing, we would have been like, oh, we had a couple of years of a really bad flu season. That's how most people, I don't care if you believe it, if they didn't terrify you with the TV and, and all the propaganda and all the shrieking and all the shutdowns and everything, if we had just gone on with life, most people would be like, oh, well, that sucked, but here we go. But government screwed everything up for everybody, even people like me who just, I just didn't participate. I run my own business. I have my own little fiefdom out here on my property. Most of the businesses didn't shut down in my area anyway. I went wherever I wanted. I did so without fear and I didn't care. But my, my life was still impacted. And if you had a job where you had your job shut down, et cetera, you had this major impact major impact in your life. And so that impact was much bigger for the world than your house burning down in a fire, right? So there is the possibility for these extreme things to happen. All I'm saying is it's the same thing I do when I talk to people about running a business. First, like, I want to start a business. Great. And then, you know, they're like wanting to tell me all about the business. Just, hold on. What kind of business do you want to start? Well, I'm going to get dogs. And, no, 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 no. What I mean is, do you want a business that's a side hustle, 
starts as a side hustle, moves, moves to full-time, is full-time, whatever. What kind of income are you looking to generate? I want to make a million dollars a year. Have you ever made a dollar by yourself in your life that somebody didn't give you a paycheck? No. Okay, let's figure out how to make one dollar. You get very upset. Well, hold on. The first thing you have to do is make a dollar. My first online business that I set up for myself, and we're not talking about, you know, selling spare parts out of the backyard or something. I'm like a real business. I was an affiliate for a company that did communications. And my first check was $63, $63. And I got the check. And at the time I was making a good six figure income. And I showed my wife and I was so happy. She goes, what are you, put all this time in, you make 63 bucks. You make 63 bucks when you're taking a dump, you know, and taking a break and you're still getting paid on your salary. You, you know, how, because it was different. So you teach somebody, let's learn how to make a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Do that again. That's $200 a month. Okay. Do that again. That's $400 a month. And a side hustle, $400 a month, will keep most people out of bankruptcy court for their whole life. Or put into the retirement, will add millions of dollars to their retirement. But we got to take the first step. So with preparedness, I try to teach it the same way. You're worried about the Russians parachuting into Colorado and Patrick Swayze rising from the grave and handing out AK-47s. Or whatever it is you're worried about. Let's worry about how the hell would you stay in your house if you lost your job next month? Because the things that we're going to do for the Patrick Swayze rising from the dead parachuting from the sky fiasco are going to start there anyway. What did they do in that movie? The original one, not the new one. They screwed it all up, right? With all the hair product and shit, right? What, what helped them the most in the beginning? Some guns, some ammo, and a bunch of canned food some people gave them. You might be able to take care of that yourself right now. I'm just saying, right? But you would also want money and some some element of value to convey value to other people because, yeah, Wolverines, right? Tim says Wolverines. Wolverines are not coming. We have our own shit to deal with, and you're going to have other people in your life that you have to deal with and help. So this is where we have to start really grabbing onto circle of influence and circle of control, and circle of concern and being willing to differentiate between them. What can you do if there is if the sun goes Nova for some reason? You can die. You can't do anything. If you're concerned about it, put that shit in the back of your mind and go on with the stuff you can do. If there's a global economic collapse, what can you do? Well, there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate it, but you can't really stop it. You're not going to stop it. You're not going to fight them. You're not going to vote yourself out of it, right? So we have to like start realizing what do I actually influence and what do I actually control? And we need to focus on that. And as soon as you do that, you start to realize, well, the things that I need most in my life then that I can procure today are the place that I need to spend my time and my mental energy and my money and my resources, and it's a real simple list of six things. This isn't your wants, okay? That you should probably have had, the, if you're a parent, I know you've had this conversation with your kids by the time they're like four or five years old, and you keep doing it all the way up until you throw them out of the house with a box full of hefty sacks to carry their shit in, right? Wants and needs. These are needs. You need food. So we can start building up a reserve of food. Eat what you store and store what you eat. Whatever it is you eat on a daily basis, build up an inventory of that and a means of maintaining it. You're like, ramen noodles and spam, do you eat that shit? Because if you do, that's fine. I actually don't hate spam. I don't want it often, but I don't... Spam's kind of like this... Spam is, of canned foods, it is the jack-in-the-box taco of canned foods. All of us, I think, live where jack in the boxes exist anyway. If we're like my age, you remember back in the 90s, going out to a bar, getting drunk, getting a ride home, and go through the jack in the box drive through and getting two big tacos for 99 cents. They had like a slice of American cheese inside this tortilla. They just folded up and stuck this nasty meat concoction in and deep fried the whole damn thing. And it looks nasty and it is nasty. 
But you're kind of like, oh, it was good, nasty, right? That's that's what spam is to me once in a while. I eat mostly beef. So I have multiple beef freezers. I have, you know, energy is what we're going to get to next, but I have an energy solution to keep it all preserved. And that's what you should do. Whatever it is, I don't, as much as I push kind of a keto carnivore lifestyle, I don't tell you how to live and I don't tell you what to eat. Some people have a hard time with that because I'm so passionate about what I do and I have so much belief in it because of how I look and feel after doing it for a few years. But that doesn't mean you have to do it. Whatever it is you eat, you need to store and have the capacity to make it last for a few months because that's about how much you need to have on hand, in my opinion. It's about 90 days worth of food. A lot of people that are hardcore preppers say one year. You go one year. Then you have to start branching out into the dry goods, the rice, the beans, and stuff like that. And we do that too, but we know exactly what that is. That's long-term emergency rations. And in most instances, it would be how I would feed my extended family when they showed up and lived in a tent because they ain't living in the house. Because they ain't done shit, and I've told them this, and they don't believe me, but they'll get a bucket of macaroni, a thing of rice, a little propane cooker, a tank, and a tent, See you guys later. You can take a bath in the, in, with the hose. And I know you think I'm kidding. I'm not. Because that's how it works, right? So long-term rations to extend out to a year. But 90 days, eat, we store, store, we eat. You need water. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. You do not need to go to the store and buy a bunch of water. There's a thing in your house. I guarantee you all you have one. You turn a little knob and water comes right out of it. Sometimes that water stops. Right now, all you need to do is... Put it in something, put a lid on it, and stick it somewhere. My advice, if you want to do rain catch, great. I do it too. I have 3,000 gallons of rain catch. Two big 1550 tanks, right? Um, that's fine. But water that's easily movable is the way to go. The number one container we have found for storing water, and we have some that are 10 years old and they're still like new, the big jugs that things like apple juice and Arizona iced tea and shit like that comes in, or two-liter soda bottles. And the reason is you, you pick two of them up and take them anywhere. So if you need to bug out and you want to take eight gallons of water with you, then you can just go grab eight bottles out of wherever you're storing it, and you can part it out all over the house, and it's basically free. And I know what a lot of you are saying. Jack, I bet you don't really eat, drink very much apple juice. You're correct. I went through a phase where I was making a lot of Sizer, which is an apple mead, and I accumulated some then but yeah i don't really spend a lot of time drinking that and i definitely don't drink arizona iced tea and i don't drink any soda at all and i really never have i mean i got to go back to being like 21 years old and drinking jack and cokes to even remember drinking coca-cola but i damn sure know people who do and you'd be surprised if you said well you save me those bottles they'll do it give them a good rinse out Put water and put the lid on them, stick them away. Don't worry about bleach or anything. As long as they're clean, it's not going to go bad. There's nothing in there to go bad. If you're that worried about it, every once in a while, use the water, refill it so it doesn't get kind of stale and flat tasting. Uh, but water, have a, a, and then shelter. Like you probably have a shelter. But what if you didn't? What if you got whipped out? What if there was a, you had to evacuate? You just need to think, how would I live if this place that I live in right now wasn't here? That's the one that people don't want to do more than any of the rest of this because it is so foreign. I'll put it this way. They say when you're dying, you have all kinds of weird visions and shit, and it may not be because you're crossing over. And I'm not here to pick on anybody's beliefs or anything with that today. I'm just saying that, like, one of the scientific explanations is that your mind can't comprehend its own death. Now, some of the samurai uh, lineage might disagree with that, that they say it's good to contemplate your own death on a daily basis. But if you're not doing that, I think there's some truth to it. I think there's some truth to it. And so with shelter, I think we kind of, not as severe, we kind of think that like what would have to go wrong is so bad. And the, the, the reality is most people, if you make them consider that, they do not have an answer. They, they legitimately don't know the answer to that question. And I want to back up on water. Dennis says, I'm still a fan of Berkey filters. Uh, asking me if I am. Yes, I am. I don't care what the government says. The government has designated Berkey filters 
as a pesticide because Berkey says they filter out bacteria. This is retarded. It is your government in action, and it's one of the major threats to your life. And so when I talk about water, the only reason I even backed up for that is, yes, you should have some sort of filtration system as well. But it starts, I'm trying to give you the basics today. It starts with store some damn water that comes out of your faucet for free. I remember I got stuck at Philly Airport one time, and I ended up getting a hotel. And uh, Jack, whatever is the Jack Black, whatever, the comedian, Lewis Black. Lewis Black was on, and he was talking about how we buy bottled water in this country. He's like, America has to be the only country where people are stupid enough. Perfectly good water comes out of your faucet, and you're like, no, fuck that. I'm going to go to the store and buy it in a bottle for a, you know, $5 a gallon or whatever. Um, yeah, there's a good, it's a good thing to have a filtration system as well, as I've always said. Uh, but shelter, that's what people like just can't conceive of it. And because they don't have an answer, they don't want to talk about it. And they don't want to consider that. You're going to find in any situation where you're trying to prepare for anything, the thing you do not have an answer for, you'll always kind of push it off. Sometimes, as long as you genuinely are going to come back to it, that may not be a terrible thing because that three pound computer in your bone skull has kind of a background process. And so if you feed yourself, I need to know what I would do in this situation. You don't have an answer right now. And you just ask yourself that question every morning for a week, you're going to end up with answers falling out. But what happens inevitably is people just push it aside and do everything else and forget about it. And they just feel better because they forgot about it, but the problem ain't gone away. So you need to think, where would you bug out to if you had to? And for how long? A tent, a trailer, et cetera, all can be viable solutions, but only for a time. And so I think it's a good idea if you have anybody, family or friends that thinks this way to talk about swaps, where if something did go wrong, I'll come to you or you come to me. Now, you might, Jack, you just said your family's going to be living in a tent and eating rice and beans. That's because they don't want to do anything. That's because they don't want to take any responsibility. That's because they have said things literally like, well, if something goes wrong, I know where I'm coming and I've told them where I stand. And then they laugh uncomfortably. That's different. I'm talking about where people are in disagreement and know like, if I come, I'm bringing X amount of resources with me. That's a good plan as well. Simply knowing where you would go and what you would do. And how you would deal with it. And in different situations. Because you might be like, well, if my house burned down, there'd be insurance money. And I would be able to get a hotel at least for a while. Would you? That might be a phone conversation to have with your insurance agent. What would it look like day one through day 60 if I had a total loss due to a fire of my home? That might be a good conversation to have because you might find out there's some kind of add-on that you could be paying 10 bucks a year for that literally would add hotel insurance. I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes it's that cheap. Sometimes it's a little bitty thing. Towing insurance on your vehicle is another one, like having insurance if your vehicle breaks down for rental. That's another one. They're very inexpensive. But a lot of people assume they have those types of coverages and they don't. See, I told you we're going to be very basic preparedness mindset today. So even the boring shit like insurance, yes, you need it. If you are a working age person with dependents and you don't have life insurance, I am sorry, you are fucking wrong and you are fucking irresponsible. Can we say it again? Just so you get through some of your thick ass skulls. I've heard from some of you about, I don't need that. What do I care? I'm dead. If you're, if you are single and no one depends on you, I don't give a shit. If you are independently wealthy where your your heirs and your spouse are well cared for no matter what happens, then I don't care either. If you are working and if your income isn't there, they're not going to eat or be able to stay in their home and you don't have life insurance, you are fucking irresponsible and you are fucking wrong and you need to fucking fix it. Okay? Okay? Just straight up on that. So shelter, energy. A lot of these interact with each other. So I have deep freezers. They do not run on jelly beans and mouse farts. They require energy. So I have enough reserve energy to keep my freezers going for at least a month. At least a month. And I do that because if I was going to be 90 days, I will find a way to preserve that meat without the freezer after it's not here anymore. And as I use it, I'll consolidate it so I don't need as much energy. I don't need to run three when one's empty. Yeah. 
But I also want energy for things like I have several portable air conditioners. And if we are without power in the summer here, it is miserable. I can run a couple portable air conditioners and close that door and close another door. And once I've done that, I have comfort zones in my home. I can run my refrigerator and my deep freezer so I don't lose all my food. That's just one thing. I have other generation power generation capability, other smaller generator. So I can run my pond so all my fish don't die. We have reserve fuel so we can get in our vehicle and go somewhere without running out of it if we need to bug out. We definitely have a plan for this, and you need one too. Health and sanitation. This is one that's really easy for me. The number one problem that people will have if you have a full grid down scenario is we often take a dump and pee multiple times a day, and you can only do that in a place for so long before you start to cause a real problem. I have a septic system. As long as my house is still here and I got 30,000 gallons of water in my pool and a bucket, we can flush. It doesn't even phase me, that part of it. But I thought about it a lot harder when I lived in a subdivision. And I actually checked into it as to how, how did my sewers get my sewage away from my house given the terrain was relatively flat. And it turned out that there was some downward gravitational flow, but there was pumping stations. And the estimate was my subdivision would be having things surface about 48 to 72 hours of those pumps not being able to run. So we thought about it a lot more. Our solution was pretty simple. Five gallon bucket, toilet seat, bunch of garbage bags and blue stuff you put in porta potty. Is it perfect? No, but it was something. It was something. And then we're like, well, if it's long term, we can start digging some holes. Digging some holes, you cut a hole in the bottom of the bucket. When the hole gets halfway full, kick the dirt back in a hole and dig another hole. At least we knew what we would do. You know, my wife has always been a, a toilet paper prepper, man. We can't go near like a Costco without coming out of that with the biggest damn pack of toilet paper. I used to make jokes about that shit. I'm like, if our house ever catches on fire, the upstairs is going to burn for two extra hours. Just from the toilet paper that's up there. She... Really, when all that shit went down with the COVIDs and people were like running through Costco's fighting each other over the last pack of toilet paper, she just gave me a look like, uh-huh, see? See? <laughs> right? But you need to have a plan for health and sanitation. So that is not just getting rid of your waste. That means medically. And if you have chronic things that need, need ongoing medication. And you're like refilling that prescription every two weeks. You need to have a conversation with your doctor. And you should have a month or more minimum in reserve. So that means I've got my two weeks or my 30 days or whatever it is they normally give me. And I've got another 30 days. And every time I fill this prescription, I take the newest stuff, just like rotating stock in a grocery uh, pantry. And I put it to the rear and I pull this one forward. And that way, I've really got 60 days or 45 days. And some of you guys, some of the medication that you're on, and I'm all for staying off pharmaceuticals if you can, but th there are pharmaceuticals that keep people alive or keep people sane. And that needs to be in reserve in a real way. You need to have basic medical knowledge. Now, you're not going to go to medical school and become a doctor just to be a prepper. But you need to know how to treat basic wounds, how to recognize certain conditions to know when to seek a higher level of care, even if there is some risk in it, and when not to. There was a guy who died during one of the ice storms, ice storms or snowstorms, not that long ago. EMS was able to get, like, really close, but not all the way in, and they wouldn't come anymore. I think this was in Chicago. And they basically were on the phone with the, this family and saying, drag the dude through the snow if you have to. Come to us. And they wouldn't do it. They refused. They made such some, some stupid ass statement like we're taxpayers. Like we can't get the vehicle in. And by the time they tried to get to him, the dude died. And they said if they would have just immediately come to us, he probably would have lived. So you need to know when. Like this is serious shit. This dude's going to die. Or this is not worth risk. I really recommend you get Dr. Bones' book about 
you know, it's basically written by a doctor for the layman. You could beat somebody to death with it. If you don't have it already, have a good med kit and know how to use it. Know how to use your medical supplies for life saving emergency shit. Like when to apply a tourniquet and how to apply it and how to do it quickly and right. Take a basic first aid course at least. Have basic medica over-the-counter medications. I still make, think it makes sense to have a reserve of antibiotics. If you pick up Dr. Bones' book on antibiotics it's called Alton's Guide to Antibiotics and Infectious Diseases. Pick that up. Get that. Get, get that uh, book and then learn about the fish antibiotics. And I won't say any more so I don't get slapped in the PP by the YouTube police. But I'll just say that the antibiotics that we buy for our fish tanks are made in the exact same plant. They're the exact same pill. They're, they don't have a fish antibiotics factory. It's the same shit. And most of the common antibiotics can be bought over the counter in a big bottle. Right. And then you have them. And after a certain amount of time, you should probably replace them. But that can be life saving because, again, I just want to reinforce just because the world doesn't end doesn't mean that yours didn't. If you have a serious infection and you're stuck wherever you live, and many of you live way out there, way out here, like what was a Josh Thompson song. And you, that's great until you can't get nowhere. And you got a serious infection. It's going to be days. It can be life-saving or at least can be life-enhancing that you have a way to treat it and you know what to do and when to do it, when to rely on it. Last is security. Security is the one that either gets over-focused on or ignored. It's partly for the same reason that the uh, the shelter one gets ignored because they don't want to look at, well, what does it mean if that actually happens? But the other reason is, and Bonnie's asking about the fish antibiotics. Can you still buy fish antibiotics? They're going to go be a veterinary prescription back in June. No, that's big time misinformation. And most of the people behind the misinformation – are my fellow influencers in the prepping industry, and all of you need to be lined up against a wall and smacked by some big arm dude all the way down the line, all the way back, until you fall on your ass and then be picked back up and have it happen again. You know why they did it, Bonnie? So they could sell through affiliate links or directly a bunch of fish antibiotics to a bunch of panic preppers that didn't know shit about what was going on. It did not apply to fish antibiotics. No one's going to take their guppy to the vet to get a fucking prescription they're lying fuckers. I'm sorry. I can't stomach the people in my industry that go after every single fear and push on it like a freaking uh, kung fu master on a pressure point to scare the fuck out of you so you'll buy shit in a panic mode that you don't need that's not the thing that you most need right now. I'm all about gear and getting shit together and being prepared. But I, from the standpoint I'm bringing it to you today, you do it logically in an order that makes sense for your life based on your resources, your risk tolerance, and the things that are most at risk for you based on where you live and where you're at in life. You don't go out and buy $500 worth of fish antibiotics because the government's going to ban it when it's not even true. And that's what these pricks were doing a few months ago. And if you did it, you're a prick. And I hope somebody sends you a clip right here because I am talking about you, you freaking shyster ass prick. Let me go back. Sorry, I didn't mean to rant today. I really didn't. Um, but security, one of the reasons we defer security is the, I don't want to think like the, the whole, well, nothing could happen here. We live in a gated community. And, you know, next thing you know, there's rioters like ripping your fucking house apart. Um, but the other reason is security is the one in a well-organized society that you can live the longest with the illusion that you do not have. And I say it's an illusion. And this is what I mean. You go walk through some of the streets in Somalia or Southside Chicago with that attitude, and you'll find out real quick how much you need your own security. But you can live in a country like the United States, even in hard times. And in most places, you can have no personal security, no situational awareness, no nothing. Go through your whole life and never get hurt because of it. Never have anybody so much as steal a phone out of your car, let alone hurt you. But it's the most important one of all of them. And the reason is, it's the one that you can be out without when you need it. 
for a millisecond. Faster than that, and you're dead. And you're dead. I've heard from numerous people in this audience that simply being armed prevented really horrible shit from happening. One dude was coming back from a farmer's market, of all things, had parked under an overpass as far back as he could, so he didn't have to deal with traffic to get out. Three dudes sitting on his vehicle waiting on him. For whatever reason, they kind of singled him out based on his vehicle, had his daughter with him. And they started talking shit to him and kind of leveraging the fact that his little girl was there and you need to give us what you have. And when he went to give him what, what he had, what he had was a fucking Glock. And three brave dudes became three chicken shits and left really quick. And that's the thing about being an armed citizen. 90% or more of the time that it pays off, the presence of the gun eliminates the problem. You don't have to shoot anybody. That's just one example. But what happens in that same situation where he's not armed? Well, maybe he just, because you, well, you just give him your stuff and it can all be replaced. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because I'll tell you another story. When I was a kid living in Jacksonville, Florida, my dad had a gas station across the street was a convenience store. Guy walks in there one day to rob the place. Has a gun. Little snub nose revolver, probably 32 or 38. Holds the girl up behind the counter. Dude standing next to him that witnesses the whole thing. Lady gives him everything that's in the cash register. He shoves it in his in his in his uh his hoodie or whatever. Looks at the dude watching him, winks at him, takes the gun, presses it to the girl's eye, and shoots her in the face and kills her. Drops to the ground, doesn't shoot the guy, just runs out of the store. Don't think compliance will always buy you safety. That's a real story. That's a real story. Looked at the dude and winked and shot the woman in cold blood because he had a bad day. Maybe he didn't get as much money as he wanted. Who knows? Or maybe he was just being an asshole because that's kind of what kind of sick bastard he was. You need to focus on personal and property security, both. And the reason, again, is, is it can be that millisecond that you didn't have it. And it's a lot of it's not just guns and gear. It's situational awareness. And I really want to dig deeper into that later when we talk about equipment training procedures and protocols. I want to talk right now about our biggest threat is economic. And I think people throw a lot of words around without knowing what they mean or they throw them around interchangeably when they're really not. And I think that's a mistake because it messes with your mindset. So let's talk about four economic problems. Recession, depression, economic collapse, and a currency default. Now, I think there's a lot of people who say, well, if you have a depression, it's an economic collapse. Not necessarily. If you have a currency default, well, that's an economic collapse. Not necessarily. A recession is simply a down period economically. Unemployment, GDP is down. Times are a little bit tough. There's a textbook definition of it. And then there's wonkiness. Like right now, you're in a recession that doesn't look like a recession because unemployment is low. But a recession is just, we have been, we go through recessions on a regular cycle. About every seven to 10 years, we have a recession. It's just part of living. It's just part of economics. And if it's not a deep recession, it's not that, it's not even that big a deal for most people, especially people who are prepared. You lost a job, but you had a plan, put it back together. What is a depression? A depression is a la 1929 stock market crash. And I don't think, because of the way we teach the virtue of war in our school systems, that people even understand how long the Great Depression really lasts, if we look at it from the standpoint of, let's say, the stock market. So this is probably what you learned in, in elementary school or junior high or even high school, right? We went into the Depression. Yeah, we went into the Depression. World War II came and it ended the Depression. Okay. Uh, bullshit. So if you go look at a graph of the Dow Jones industrial average of the stock market and you see the crash of 1929 and then it kind of goes up and down, dead cat bounces and then bottoms out in the early 30s. And then it is nothing but up from there, really. 
And in the Warriors, it starts going up a little bit stronger. But do you know what year? You're close, oops. You're close, oops. You know what year the Dow Jones regained its 1929 high? He says 1950. That would, be a, that would be a depression. That's a long time. 1956. 1939 and 1956 to come back. So if your 401k takes it up the butt in a depression, you could be looking 29 to 39 to 49, almost 30 years, 59, right? A lot of you guys don't have three years until you retire. Now, you could be continuing to chunk it in during the, the build back up and all. But you see what I'm saying? Like, that's a depression. A depression is where there is no work, and the work that's there doesn't pay jack shit. Everything's cheap, but it doesn't matter because you can't afford it. And the big thing about depressions, rich people get very, very, very rich in depressions because they have capital and they can buy everything at a discount. So that's a depression. What's an economic collapse then? Well, during the Great Depression, there was some higher crime rates and stuff like that, but it was not an economic collapse. An economic collapse is where the country or the region really folds in on itself. You're talking martial law if there's a functioning government, and it's always a corrupt martial law in that functioning government. You're talking there is no real economy left. You are down to barter economies, right? You are, you are, it, it doesn't matter. The currency is kind of irrelevant at that point. There's such a shortage of goods and services that you're in a needs based barter economy. You're looking at basically regional warfare in a true economic class. There is no law and order. It is without rule of law. And often you have a balancing act. You have WROL, without rule of law, and what I coined as EROL, excessive rule of law. And the two can coexist. Over here, no one gives a shit, but over here, they can throw you in jail because you didn't do something the state said was part of the economic emergency. That was not the Great Depression. We did not have an economic collapse in the Great Depression. We had a depression. They are different. It's important to delineate that in your mind. Lastly, we have a currency default. Well, come on, Jack. A currency default equals an economic collapse and a depression. No. We had a currency default 1964 with the silver coinage act. That was a currency default. FDR confiscating the gold and rebasing the dollar, $13 higher than it was per ounce. That was a currency default. Going to the Federal Reserve System in 1913 and coming off of a gold and silver standard that was market commodities based, that was a currency default. 1971, when Nixon closed the, closed the gold, gold window, that was a currency default. None of that other shit really happened. There's some recession and depression mixed in with that. But there was no economic collapse. And in the case of FDR, the currency default came after the Depression began. It's really important to understand that there are a lot of gray shades in all of this. That it's not everything is super and then everything is Mad Max. Because that's where people come to this from and it's a mistake. So what are some basic... Common sense preps. I'm going to go through this list quick so we don't go too long today. 30 to 60 days of food without complete boredom. So that does not mean 30 to 60 days of beans and rice, rice and beans and beans and rice, and ramen noodles and uh, macaroni elbows. Those are fine as long-term reserve starvation assets. You should be able, at any point in your life, to not get in your car for one to two months Eat a good, balanced meal a couple, three times a day, every day, and not be out of food till the end of that window. 30 minimum, 60 is a really great number to shoot for. 
Ability to deal with that initial power loss in five to ten minutes. What do I mean by that? I don't mean in five. Now, if you have a whole house uh, generator that's on natural gas and your power goes, it comes right back on. That's great. Most people don't have that. If you, if you, if I could, I would. I don't have natural gas service. Or I would. I, if I had natural gas service, it's the last utility to fail. I would have a Generac whole house backup system. I would absolutely invest in it, but I don't. What I mean when I say deal with the power outage in one to five minutes is you know where your blackout kit is. Your blackout kit is your basic lights, emergency weather radio, all that stuff. It is the stuff that allows you to enact your next level of power redundancy. So if you have a generator and it's not automatic backup and you need to go out and wheel it out somewhere and start plugging shit in or run your cable over your cutoff switch or whatever, I don't expect you to have that done in five minutes. But I expect you, you're in a room of your house. There is no lights. Once the power goes out, it is dark. You got, you're got you in the shower with soap in your head. The power goes out and the kid's crying. That you have set up your home to where there's some sort of power failure lights that are plugged in that come on. Some way where you can see good enough to go get your things and, and hand the kid a flashlight or a little lantern so he stops crying. Take I, I t- love little E-Tech City lanterns. There are like four of them for like 25 bucks. Little hooks in different rooms of the house. Open a lantern, hang it from the hook. We can see. Now we can get our shit together. That's actually the first step. If you use can't, where are the candles? Where's the lighter? Like knowing where this stuff is and centralizing one or two blackout kits. Maybe if you have a big house, one on each side of the house that at least gets your shit together. That's a minimum first step. Then you need power and the, for the basic needs of at least 14 days, two full weeks of comfort. Be able to run again. If you live in the South, a couple window unit air conditioners, a couple kerosene heaters or propane heaters in the North. Both if you live in a mixed climate, right? The ability to charge your batteries, charge your cell phones, to stay in touch with the world and see what's going on. Next, the ability to deal with waste for 30 days if you have to, just like I talked about earlier. What would you do if you couldn't flush the toilet for 30 days? Have an answer. And the answer is either, here's my answer, or I can flush my toilet. Unless a nuclear bomb lands on my house, I can flush my toilet. However, I can have flooding, okay? I still have a redundancy for backup because if we have bad enough flooding, my leach field can push back into my septic system. But I have backup power and I have a sump pump with a uh, float valve on it. And I have, when that very thing happened, we still, it wasn't really that bad. But it was a problem for a few days. And I put two garden hoses together, dropped that bitch down in the liquid side tank, ran it down to my fence, and just let it run. We had power during that, but I could run that off of a generator, no problem. Have a plan to deal with your waste for at least 30 days. The ability to treat basic injuries and illness, as I said earlier. The ability to keep your home sound in any damage that's not catastrophic. What does that mean? It means you have some tarps and some freaking roofing nails for one. Look and think about, here's an interesting thought experiment you can do. And sometimes you can do it in real time. When there is whatever the most common natural disasters are in your area and your house isn't affected, don't do it right away so you're not dogpiling on people. But take a drive through the neighborhood that got hit with the tornado and of the houses that are standing, what did those people do? to get by until they could get it properly repaired. Then you get the shit that you need to be able to do that. Sometimes it's things like a chainsaw to get, you know, a a branch or a tree out of your driveway so you can leave your house. Because maybe you need something that you could go get because it's not the end of the world and the Lowe's or Home Depot is open, but you can't get out. Because if you think you can move a tree just because you go to the gym... You don't know trees. We had, I'll tell you, one night we had, I was sitting watching old school Star Trek, original series with the dog, and we heard a deep thump. And uh, the dog looks at me and I was like, I heard it too, buddy. I go outside and I'm standing there just aghast. 
140 feet of my fence is gone. Dude ran off the road, got stuck in the ditch, channeled down my fence line. And what we heard was he hit a tree that stopped him. And I'm convinced if that tree wasn't there, he would have went through my neighbor's house. Well, EMS comes and my whole gate, I have this big giant gate. People mock me and say it looks like Hogan's Heroes, especially when Max the Shepherd used to be running around before he was gone. And the way that was twisted up, I mean, I eventually would have got it cleared out, but what, it would have been a lot of work with an angle grinder and a sawzall. Uh, the EMS guys got the freaking jaws of life and cut some shit apart for me and cleared it out so we could get the vehicle out. And there was a way out. I have a way I could have went around and out, but if we didn't have that way out, I got two big bar ditches on both sides of that driveway. So unless I had my other field that I can drive around the backside and get out, I'd have been stuck until we figured out how to get out of there. So it can happen. That's part of maintaining your structure, just so you think that way. Next, water for at least 30 days for all needs. That's cooking, drinking, and bathing. You need enough water to go a month. And again, it doesn't, none of, understand, I'm not saying if you don't have all this done by next week, you're wrong. Except breadwinners who don't have life insurance. You better have life insurance by next week or I will kick your ass if we meet in person. I swear to God, that is the most... And I have a good friend who passed away years ago. His name was Hal Dodd. And he had no life insurance. He told his wife he did. And he was one of my best friends. I'd like to dig him up and kick his ass over it. That, that's why I'm such a hot button on that one. Because I know it just... She ended up okay, but it just about wrecked her. Don't you ever be responsible for income for a family and not have insurance on your ass at least a couple years wages because that's at least long enough to figure out what to do like the standard recommendation is 10x you make 100 grand a year you need a million dollars in insurance i think it's a great recommendation but if you got two years that gives a person time to figure out how to adapt and adjust and it depends on what you can cover um next Money to pay for your expenses for 90 days. And that's without rating your IRA or something like that. You need a 90 day emergency fund. If you are $20,000 in debt right now, you might be like, that's, that's a great thing, Jack. I can't do it. No, what you can do is you can save up $1,000 and then you debt snowball your $20,000 worth of debt. And when you get done with that, then you build your 90 day emergency fund. Again, this doesn't all have to be done next week, but that needs to be the goal. That's the destination. But you need, if you're going to like snowball on debt where you're going to sell everything in the house, the kids are afraid you're going to sell the dog in them next. It really makes a lot of sense before you do any of that to build up 500 to to $1,000 in an emergency fund. And this is why somewhere along the way, you're going to drive over a piece of steel and blow two tires out on your car and it's not going to be covered or something like that. And you're going to end up whipping out a credit card and backpedaling. If you have that emergency fund, then you cover it, you restock the emergency fund, and you go back to dealing with the debt. Dave Ramsey impression done for the day. Yeah. But 90 days, that needs to be the goal. If we all lost our jobs without digging into the long-term security that we have, we can go 90 days, pay the mortgage, the car payments, et cetera. You might have to scrounge to get there, but baseline, you got to get that done. If you're 25 and you don't have that done, I'm not going to give you shit. If you're 35 and you don't have it done, you should have done it by now. All right? And you could have done it by now, and you didn't. So now you need to man up and accelerate a little bit quicker. Um. Then let's talk about security for your home and your persons. So the acronym I created for this is ETPP. I think it's pretty easy to remember. ETPP, right? ETPP. It's equipment, training, procedures, and protocols. And I'll go fast on this today, too. Equipment is the stuff that you have. When it comes to personal defense, equipment is your gun and your extra magazine and your holster, right? That's, that's equipment. If it's around the house, equipment might be something like motion sensors around your property. It's equipment. Really easy to understand. Training is your ability to do the other three things. Training is your conditioning and your ability to under stress, use your equipment 
to know when to implement protocols and to know how to do procedures. That's training. The other three without training are worse than useless because they are a false sense of security. If you carry a gun and you haven't drilled drawing, reloading, fixing malfunctions and shit, and you think you're going to be John Wick when some shit goes down, you are Delulu, man. You are freaking deep in the world of Delulu. So Delulu. Don't even know what to say to you. you. People always say you revert to your highest level of training. This is utter fucking nonsense. And when I hear people that say, I was a Navy SEAL. No, you weren't, because you wouldn't be saying stupid shit like that if you were, because you know damn well you revert to your lowest level of training. Your lowest level of training is your highest level of mastery. The thing you can do over and over and over again. Your highest level of training is the last time you stretched yourself past that and until you do it enough times that it becomes your level of mastery, you do not revert to that. You revert to your lowest level of mastery. So you need to train and not just how to have a gunfight, right? You need to train. I got a gunfight. I'm not dead. I'm not even injured. The bad guy's dead. But the innocent civilian I was protecting is laying on the floor bleeding out. How do I save his ass? That's training. You have a tourniquet. It is useless if you don't know how it works, right? Then it leads us to procedures. Procedures, and I have a whole show just on security where I go into this deeply. Procedures are the way you do a thing. When I was in the military, we learned rappelling. There's a way that you can tie a rope on yourself. It's called a Swiss seat. There is one way to do it. There are not two ways to do it. If you do it the wrong way, you may very well die. So you train that procedure until you can do it cold. Sometimes there's more than one procedure that's the right way to do a thing, but you train your procedure until you can do your procedure cold. If there's a secondary procedure, then you train that one too. Like when you can't rack a pistol because your hands are covered in blood or grease or whatever it is, and you learn how to rack it on the heel of your foot, that is a secondary procedure. But it is a procedure. It is how you do a thing. How you clean your weapon is a thing, and it's how you do it. And obviously that relates directly to your training. And training does not always mean somebody else does it. You can self-train in so many of these things. And then you have protocols. Protocols are the conditions under which you enact a specific set of procedures. So what I mean by that is right now, if my grandkids want to go outside and play, they just go outside and play. Maybe we send a dog with them. If anybody is checking around that gate with that dog, I ain't worried. I'll be calling 911. They can follow the blood trail. Right? But that's garden variety shit. Now, if there were riots going on down in Lake Worth, which is a few miles away from me, I might up my protocol to know you don't go out with us without us watching you. I might not be real worried about having some things sitting out on my back porch if I live in a suburb on a daily basis with my gates closed. It's not, it's not too high value of a thing. But if there's a rash of burglaries or whatever going on, I might bring stuff inside. When the power's out, I'm going to behave differently than when the power's on. I'm going to start rationing power. If we are going without food, on it, you know, we're not bringing food in for some reason. We're going to ration food. Those are protocols. When do I shift our security protocol or our consumption protocol or our communications protocol? Those are protocols. Procedures, how you do a thing, protocols, when you do things a certain way due to conditions around you. And you have standard protocols. Most people don't need to go that far. That's the way you do a thing every day when it's peacetime protocol, right? In the military, you have a protocol for friggin' everything. There's a protocol for how you fold your fucking underwear, and I'm not kidding, and they do measure it with a freaking ruler. And a tenth of an inch is wrong if it's too short or too long. It's six inches. I don't know, it might have changed, but that was six inches. You rolled your underwear, it's the way you rolled your t-shirts, it's the way you rolled your socks. Protocol for everything. We don't need to go that far. We just accept the way we behave on a regular basis is peace on protocol. But then we need additional elevated protocols, and you need to know this before it happens, not after. Because that way you can train your family 
very gently. Some of you ex-military guys like me, you can't go drill sergeant on their ass. It doesn't work. Trust me, I tried it. Okay, you got a reserve drill sergeant for one. Your 15-year-old did something really stupid. <laughs> really stupid. Okay? You can just, by exposing them to the concepts, that way when there's a panic moment, we know what to do. And even if they don't remember, you do. You take that leadership position and you start saying this, 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 and this. And everybody calms down as soon as you're able to do that in any situation. Protocols. ETPP. The ability to help neighbors is something else I think we need to think about. Okay. I don't care. You don't care about the little old lady that watches your kids after school every day? Really? You don't care about your neighbors? You know that if, like, everything's great for you and you don't do anything to help them, eventually you're going to be like, screw that asshole, they're going to turn on you? We need to think about being able to coordinate. We don't have to do all of this in advance. You'll find like-minded people you can rely on. But, hey, if there's riots, a divided neighborhood is where they're going to cause the most trouble. And a united neighborhood is where they're not. not. We've all seen it. Bunch of rednecks with a big old plywood sign, you loot, we shoot. Guess what they don't get? Looted. Trust me. Doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So make sure you think about your neighbors. The ability to communicate and get information. Cell phones are fantastic. I get it. I have one. Computers and the internet are fantastic. But you need to think about, well, what would I do? Some of this is simple. You have a backup energy source. You have a television. If you live near any metropolitan area, something as simple as a set, set of old school rabbit ears probably gets you three or four channels. During a real disaster, one of them will be running news all the time. That will give you information. Most of the time, these little magic box cell phones will work. And even if internet is down, as long as there's cell signal, at least you can text. But they don't run on jelly beans. They don't run on unicorn farts. They run on power. And so most of us can handle this because we are smart enough to know, plug it into your car and let your car idle. Hook up a, you know, the other thing, you hook up an inverter to your battery and you run your refrigerator. Have some extra gas, et cetera. But have the backup power plan coordinate with this ability to communicate. It is not a terrible idea to add radio to what you do. I'm not a ham. I'm not taking a test. I don't give a shit about it. I have the equipment and I know how to use it. And that way, as long as I can get in touch with anybody who can get in touch with other people, I can get information about what's going on. We run a scanner. We know what's going on from a standpoint of law enforcement. That can be incredibly important as well. So it's not always that everything's down. It's that you just don't know what you don't know. So it means to communicate and receive information. When we have power outages due to weather, I instantly have that TV set on with those antennas tuned into a local news station like CBS, NBC, Fox, whatever. Whoever's coming in best and whoever's talking about the storm. That way I know what's going on around me. Where I live, tornadic storms are the biggest environmental threat that we have on a regular basis. And it's no joke. And so we stay weather aware. That's one way that we do that. Um. The ability to move out and survive away from home and to get back home. This is your 72-hour kits, but it's more importantly, it's your plan. And what goes straight with that is a full documentation kit. In that, it, it, that documentation kit is basically a three-ring binder. It has maps that you've printed out out of Google Maps. It gives you three places that you can go if you have to evacuate your home and three different routes to each of them for a total of nine routes. That's one thing it has. It has all the information you need to be able to put your life back together. And if you have things like bank account numbers and stuff in there, then you use your own version of encryption. I won't get into that. You encrypt it. So if somebody finds it, unless they're the NSA, they're not going to know what to do with it. Most important is things like phone numbers and shit like that of who to call. In there, you should also have things like several motels that you can go to short term. Short term. OK, not long term, short term. And if you have dogs or cats that will be traveling with you, you need to find the places that will allow for them in advance. Like 
I remember when I started talking about it, we're like, do you give me a prepper with an Amex card and a dog crate? Yes, I will in situations where that is the proper preparation. All this survivalist shit where people, it's all guns and ghillie suits and beans and band-aids and whatever. No. We have to prepare for everything. And we start with the most likely things. And people will say, well, during a hurricane, you can't get a hotel. Somebody did. That's why you can't get one. The person that already knows who to call is already ready to make the call. And as soon as they know they're going to need to jump, makes the call is the one that gets the room. And that's why you didn't get one. So having that documentation kit, again, this is all the people in your life you would need to get in touch with, their phone numbers, their emails, et cetera. You should probably do something to make sure you have passwords uh, and the ability to connect into all the accounts you might have to log into. I think there's a big place for having an encrypted USB stick for some of the things that you wouldn't want falling into somebody else's hands. But at least you have that. But be ready to go. Right. Have that documentation on the kit. Start working on your situational awareness and your positive mental conditioning now. Right now, this minute and for every day going forward. Situational awareness is as simple as like when we drive somewhere, I just try to pick out two or three things I never noticed before. Even if I've been through that place a 100 times. I, I don't take the same route every time when I come home or go somewhere. Not just so I'm not patterned. I'm not that paranoid that I think I mean patterned good protocol anyway, by the way, even in peacetime, but I do it because it makes me look at different things. And then positive mental conditioning is often like, it seems weird, but you have to think about the negative first. If this, then that thinking. So you're pumping gas. You see some people that look a little bit sketchy. You should start taking corrective action, but you should also be gaming out. What if these guys approach me? What would I do? And that way you know what you would do and you're reverting to your lowest level of training, not your highest, because that's a myth. Because I'll tell you, with training, the thing that you can do in the freezing rain with a flashlight in your teeth and numb fingers at 3 a.m. in the dark, that's the thing you're properly fully trained for. That's not your highest level of training at your lowest, right? Um, but yeah, you need to work on that positive mental conditioning and that is... If I know what I'll do when something bad happens, I'm less worried about the bad thing happening. And I keep a positive mental attitude throughout the whole thing. Uh, next, basic fitness and reasonable activity. I Look, guys, I lost a lot of weight. I don't want to be some prima donna like looking down on people and shit now. But I'm just going to tell you flat out, if you stand up, you stand up straight back like you're at attention in the military and you don't lean forward and you look down. With your head only, you keep your shoulders and back straight, and you do not see your feet, you are not physically fit, and you are at risk of serious medical complications. If you are a woman with a well-endowed chest, and that's why, I guess you could you know, look through the middle, like do it topless if no one's around or whatever, somebody is, you know, and if you can't see your feet other than because of, of that well-endowment, then you're not healthy, man or female. You're not. That would be a good place to start. Get to where you can see your freaking feet. You don't have to work out every day, go to the gym, be a big old muscle guy or anything. Like that. Do something. Take a couple mile walk every day. Do something. Be physically active because you don't know when you're going to need to be able to be physically active. We all age and we all get to a point eventually where things start to break down and wear out. But we don't need to help the process along. We need to go kicking and screaming all the way, in my opinion. That's all I'll say about that. But get a good diet in place. You don't agree with me on what a good diet is. I don't care. Get a good diet in place. Because this is what when people say, but I eat this way and look how healthy I am. Every option other than the standard American diet is better than the standard American diet. Period. Because anytime you become consciously aware of the food you're putting in your face, you make better decisions. Be healthy, as healthy as you can be. Um, build a network of friends and contact that you can count on and trust. Basic networking one-on-one. Do all these things, and you'll be ahead of most of the people they used to put on that stupid show, Doomsday Preppers. These guys, they had giant warehouses full of beans and rice and shit and 800 guns, and they're going to fight off the Illuminati or whatever, 
Most of those guys, if they lost a job, they'd be broke anyway. They probably have that damn compound on debt at 7% interest on owner financing. It's going to get repossessed and taken over the minute they don't have a job. None of the stuff that I gave you today is that hard. Now, if you if you are at zero, and you try to go to zero to hero with all this shit in two weeks, it is insurmountable. And it will burn you out, and you don't need to do it. You need to pick and choose the places that you slowly build up the basics. And if you're a seasoned prepper, and many of you are, then you use a show like this and this fundamental exercise to go, here's five places I'm weak. Of those five places, if there's a failure – this failure is the most catastrophic. I'm going to pick this one, and I'm going to I'm going to tune it up, and I'm going to go back to my other four, and I'll pick the next one based on that, and I'm going to tune it up, and I'll pick the next one, and I'm going to tune it up, unless one of them is literally something you can just do today. It's not really an expense. It's not an acquirement. It's just something you could just fix. Then you do the easy one, and then you go to the most catastrophic if it fails. And if you do this every once in a while, right, if you do this every once in a while, your resiliency just grows across time. Let me tell you something about resiliency. It's what I always talk about TikTok, the clock ticks for us all. Resiliency is part of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, independence, and liberty. You are building that and getting a little bit more of it every day or you're going backwards. There's no static because life will move you in the wrong direction unless you intentionally move in the right one. That's why this is important. And this is a big one. Don't think everything is just okay because it's not on fire yet. There's a lot of people that I know that were preppers that have kind of fallen off prepping at a time when we're probably closer to economic crisis of some kind than we've ever been in most adults' lives. Why? Because it's been this bad for this long, and in the end, it's all just been okay. It can all go south. The national economy, the global economy can all go south almost overnight. Now, it won't be overnight, but it'll look and appear like it was. Or your personal economy, your personal life can all go south overnight. Most people are one to two paychecks away from poverty. And, and, and one to two months of lacking paycheck from being evicted. And that's only because the law keeps people in their home for longer than it would otherwise if it was just market-based. Some places, maybe, you know, maybe you can stay in your home for 90 days or more. I've known people fight evictions for almost a year before they physically got thrown out. But their lives were destroyed during that time. They were spending more energy trying to keep in their home for free as long as they could than fixing their life. Where if you could just pay the bills, you just go fix your life. The stuff I'm talking about today can be the thing that saves your ass in an economic collapse or riots, or a storm. But it can also be the thing that makes you lose your job. Not makes you lose your job, but when you lose your job. There's two ways people handle that. One is they go get, you know, climb in a bottle or something and go pour me and think their life is over. Start making really dumb decisions and maybe go out and take some shitty job they really don't want. But I've heard from a lot of people in this audience that have put their shit together the right way. And when they lost a job, they did exactly what the other option is. Take a couple days off. Go have a nice meal. Take a walk in the woods or something. Think about what you really want in your life. Get your resume on the street. Start contacting all the contacts you've maintained because you're prepared for that to happen. And choose your next chapter of your life. See, when you properly prepare... Let's be honest. There are some disasters or disasters, no matter what. But you can at least mitigate it to some degree. As long as you're alive, there's something you can do. But there's also a lot of other things that are extreme disasters for some people that are minor inconveniences for others. As you saw today, I can get pretty hot-tempered. One of the reasons we got rid of our Subaru is they tried to screw us out of about $1,800 in work that was all supposed to be warranty. And they build us for shit they should have never built a, build us for in the first place. Not just because it was warranty, because it shouldn't even have been built. They build us for a software update, for instance. We took it in for a standard service. I completely lost my shit on the service rider on the other end of the phone. And I finally said, do you know why I am so pissed? 
And he said, I imagine because we, we in, incorrectly tried to bill you 1800 or $600, whatever it was. No, because I was never going to pay it. And if I had to pay it, it wouldn't be the end of the world for me. But tomorrow you're probably going to do this to some single mother who's going to put it on a Visa card because she needs her car and she doesn't know what I know. And you guys are predators. So knowledge is key too. Knowledge is key too. But let's just imagine that that wasn't Subaru's fault. That it was really $1,600 worth of, worth of work my car needed. I would have, you know, if I looked at it and said, okay, that's really what it costs and it really needs, okay, go ahead and do it. And I would have wrote him a check and I would have cussed. And by next Saturday, I would have forgot about it. And if somebody brought it up, I would have ramble, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then back to my life, right? But there are people, a $1,600 unforeseen expense, it's crippling. And there's shades of gray all the way in between it. What I laid out for you today is not a way to guarantee that none of it will be crippling, but a shitload of it that would be minor inconveniences. Things that would be life-altering, temporary life resets. And that's the best that we can do. Uh, Ace B says you should get a new Ford Maverick best value out there. Of course, uh, there's a waiting list. I didn't know there was a new Ford Maverick. I don't know that I want a new Ford Maverick. I don't even know what they look like. You're hitting the car guy at me a little bit there. I, I think about all of the Mavericks that were available, the old school Mavericks, right? When I was a teenager for a few thousand dollars, they could just stack them in a garage somewhere and then rebuilt them eventually and what they're worth now. And it just, Oh, it kicks me in the teeth. I think about the fact there was this place. I was totally off the subject, but now you got me on it, right? There was this place that was only a few miles from where I grew up and went to high school in Pennsylvania. And they had 70s Stingray Corvettes. It was like what they specialized in and for used cars. And these cars were like 10 years old at the time. They were cherry. And they were like 55, 6,500 bucks. And they just go back and... If I picked up enough scrap copper, could have bought a couple of them, just stuck them away. Barely ran them, just ran them enough to keep them from breaking out. Like, or uh, also unrelated was, uh, I remember when uh, a whole bunch of 30 carbines, like Korean War issue 30 carbines, Cosmoline paper wrapped around them and shit, never issued, came into a place called Lane Co. They were 69 bucks with everything, pristine. And I remember asking my dad about, ah, they're worthless. You can't kill a deer with them. <laughs> oh, for a time machine. I think we all use it a little bit differently. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed today's show, including a little levity there at the end. want to remind you again, TSP 23 Fall Workshop. You want to come hang out with me and a bunch of other cool people, get up at least by 9, be in front of your screen, watch the Telegram group and the Telegram channel, and I'm going to drop a link in there at exactly 09.30 Central Standard Time. If there are any tickets left at 09.40, I will make it public on the site, and I will put it out in all the social media and send an email. Some years that happens. Last year it did. Some years we don't get there. This old South Park joke, right? And it's gone. And so this is going to be awesome. Uh, and on that note, Stephen Reisner from Potent Ponics is going to be here. He's going to be doing a fantastic presentation. He's probably worth coming to see alone. And I will actually be on a podcast with him tonight at 730 Central. I don't know how to tell you to find it yet, but if you monitor my social media today, as soon as he gets me the link, I'll send it because I think we're doing it live. And I don't even know what we're talking about. It's so whatever he wants to talk about, and that should be fun. Uh, but if you can come, please, 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 please. Don't miss out because, again, I don't worry about selling all the tickets. I worry about the person that emails me 45 minutes after the sale's over and asks me when they go on sale. Or the person that emails me and they're pissed because they didn't get in. Um, I have people all the time, can I get, buy two tickets earlier? No, I can't. I tell people I know on a first-name basis, no, every year because we limit it to 50 people. All right. With that, if you like the show and you want to support us, one of the ways you can do that is buy your, on buy your online stuff going through tspaz.com. That's T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. No matter what you buy, as long as you start there, 
you help us out. And uh, today's item of the day is basically just a deal of the day alert. You guys know I love sous vide cooking. I think it's a great way to make a good steak even better. It's a great way to take a cheap piece of meat and make it juicy, delicious, and tender. There's a lot of other hacks you can do with sous vide. You can make yogurt, for instance. We use a sous vide circulator to heat up water for dishwashing at events. You can do all kinds of things with sous vide. You can take steaks that you already have pre-seasoned, vacuum sealed, thrown in the freezer, right out of the freezer frozen. An hour and a half later, you're eating a steak that was frozen an hour and a half ago. You can use it on a low setting just to rapidly defrost meat. They're just great. Why am I saying all this? Because Anova's Nano is on sale today. Um, stupid cheap. It is 85 bucks, I think. Let me see. Uh, it is on sale for $85. It's normally $149. $64 off, 43% cheaper than normal. And this is one of the best ones out there. Now, if you use the link in my write-up for it, uh, you will go to, well, it's now it's 100 bucks. It went up. This happens. This is why I wanted to point this out. This is why you should follow me on social media. So it's gone from 84 to 100. And there's a lot of times they run these sales like this. And as they sell a certain amount, they keep bringing the price back up. So now it's, I'm going to have to modify the write-up. So now it's 30% off instead of 46% off. That's the TSP effect maybe. Um, but it is a specific model that I have linked from there. There's a bunch of different options with these. A lot of times there are things like a color of the little ring around the top or whatever. This is the black and red one, like it matters. See how it's red there? Okay. Anyway, um, this is why you should follow me on social media. This is why you should get on the Telegram channel. That's 15 bucks the damn thing went up with since I started the podcast this today. But uh, it's still a good deal out of hundred bucks. It's still a good deal out of hundred bucks. If you do not have a sous vide machine in your life, you want to get one in your life, this is buying the premium one for the price of the discount one. Anova is probably the best on the market right now. Sorry about uh, the fact that some of y'all missed the super stupid cheap price as it was a little bit ago. Anyway, guys, I uh, need to let you go. And I appreciate you being with me today. Tomorrow we'll have an expert council Q&A show. And uh, then Monday we'll be back with another Just Jack show. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. Do something with it. Make something out of it. Remember, you always need to think about the fact. You know, I talked about earlier the mind can't comprehend its own death, but the samurai always said it was good to comprehend your own death. I think it's good to comprehend your life or contemplate your life with an understanding that it is finite. And that's part of what makes it special. And that someday they're going to put you in the ground. There's going to be a date you were born, a date you die, and a dash, a hyphen in the middle. That hyphen will represent everything you ever did, everything you ever said, good and bad. Make the most of it. I'll catch you guys again tomorrow.